Raphael explains the terms Satan, devil, demons, and their influence. Chapter 94 Says Raphael, My dearest friend Roclus, temper yourself, for these were indeed rock-solid Pharisees. But now they have become our disciples, and will see the error of their ways. And as far as the devils are concerned, you still know too little about them to truthfully speak of their influence on man. Once you have gained a closer understanding of them, then will you be able to speak of it as well. You see, that which is called Satan and Devil is the world itself and all the enticing splendor thereof. All the matter the world consists of is, of course, a work of God as well, and divine things are hidden within. But beside the divine, there is also lying, deception and enticement, the very things from which sprout envy, avarice, hatred, arrogance, persecution, and all other burdens imaginable, countless in number and unfathomable in measure. And lo, this falsehood, lying and deception, is Satan, in a spiritual sense, and all the individual burdens that must necessarily emerge therefrom are exactly what we call devil. And each and every soul devoted to one or more of these countless burdens is a devil in the shape of a man, an active expression of wickedness and evil. Within souls such as these burns a nigh inextinguishable drive to perpetually commit evil in the manner they established during the time of their corporeal existence. Since every soul lives on after the death of the body and continues to dwell in the region of this earth, it not seldom occurs that a soul afflicted with such vices, in hopes of finding a source of nourishment, seeks to enter the external sphere of life of a person harboring a natural propensity towards the same vices, with its aim being to arouse evil within them as well, a proclivity commonly traceable to an upbringing of abuse and neglect. Such a soul occasionally even takes possession of the flesh of a person, and thereby torments particularly frail souls. The Lord permits this, however, to mend such spiritual leaks. For only by this does the tormented soul gain a true and spirited reluctance towards such reprobate weaknesses of the flesh. In the end, it will do everything in its power to grow strong where once it was weak, an endeavor the Lord's mercy will assist in, in good time. Behold, this is reasonably correct and true, something a Jew should certainly understand. However, he does not understand it, being far removed from the actual subject matter, which is why he considers Satan and devil to be a spiritually personified evil willpower, a force that finds great pleasure in alienating people from walking the path of God's order. Although these twisted souls have no intentions in opposition to God, for they do not recognize him to begin with, and they are too blind and foolish to have any form of intention at all. For apart from themselves, they do not recognize any desire at all, and they act solely out of pure self-interest. They seize only what their selfishness desires, and they are supremely distrustful amongst one another which is why a communal effort is wholly unconceivable among them. And you are most correct in your assertion that their power is null and void. Indeed, it is null and void against people that have completely embraced the love and will of the Lord. Though consider those who are still on the fence. When weighing their spiritual and material attributes on a set of scales, no favor towards either side is revealed. It follows that, in any matter of passionate concern to the soul, the addition of a demonic presence concealed within that same passion will certainly tip the morality scales towards the material side. Should this be the case, will the soul have great difficulty disengaging from the material and connect with the spiritual? 
Should the soul remain amidst material matters, then will ever more like-minded demons latch themselves onto the material scale pan, the collective weight of which becomes quite noticeable. The material continues to gain importance, while the spiritual, consequently, grows ever more irrelevant. And so, you see then, the devils of the Jews and the demons of the Greeks can inflict significant harm on a soul during the time of its formation, without even having an actual intention of harming it. Chapter 95 Roclus' Objections Says Roclus, How can an intelligent being harm someone without wishing to? Even a demon must at least possess a certain degree of pride and self-confidence as to know what he wants. And if he knows what he wants, he makes himself liable for prosecution. To permit such clandestine whisperings of the wicked demons to innocent souls, I do not find quite right either. And even if it is allowed by some hidden wisdom, then one cannot find fault with the poor soul, spoiled by the devils. However, if the devils possess neither intelligence nor any form of free will as a result, then they cannot harm the soul either. And if they inflict harm nonetheless, then neither the devil, void of intelligence and will, nor the soul that fell prey to it, are guilty, and the responsibility would fall on the one who approved such a thing. Thus I pass judgment freely, and I feel no shame in declaring it here openly. But if the devils, as one says, are even fiercely intelligent, which can certainly be assumed when considering their ability to readily scent any poor soul's particular weakness in the material sphere, then they must have a will to harm it. In this case, once again, the soul remains innocent, and only the devils, as well as the one who permitted them, are to blame. Give me some weapons and show me the enemy, and I will make sure he will not get close to me. But when I do not even know the enemy, one who can inflict significant harm to me by secretly and invisibly enticing me to the most hideous of vices. And then, on top of that, I must also carry the blame for it, together with its most severe consequences. Well, then, thank you for such a life. This would be the same as throwing a naked and weak person out into the middle of a pack of hungry wolves, hyenas, lions, tigers and panthers, once he is inevitably torn apart and consumed by them, he will then have to bear the blame for it as well and be damned by the judge, simply because he was utterly defenseless and weak, having allowed himself to be carried away by armed, unfeeling henchmen out into the wilderness, and then be torn to shreds and eaten by wild beasts. What does your heavenly wisdom think of such justice? Friend, if the reality of the demons and devils is as such, and the poor, suffering human soul remains the sole bearer of the blame, regardless of whether or not the devils spoiling it do possess intelligence and will, then, then there exists no wise and loving God, instead only a magical and blindly omnipotent being, that is, a form of fate, taking immense pleasure in discord of all types, like the High Romans do, and against which a man can only sin if he himself eagerly accepts wisdom by righteous means. Truly, I say to you, if your words unmistakably describe the reality of the situation, then the Pharisees are right. But I have heard the Lord himself speak on such matters, and may I say, basing myself thereupon, that you, beautiful messenger of God's heaven, have fallen a bit by the wayside this time. And I stand by my word that, with my love for God, I will single-handedly scatter the previously mentioned Pharisaic devils to the winds. Chapter 96 The Demons and Their Influence Says Raphael, gently smiling, Behold, my friend, even you have already had three full beakers of wine and it has gone to your head, that is, out with the spirit. 
and as such, your reasoning has grown even more critical than it was before. You are absolutely correct in your assertion that the demons, no matter the number, are powerless when faced with an individual dwelling in the love for God. For there exists no communal effort among them. Each and every one of them harbors the greatest selfishness and self-love. So it does not even occur to any of them to support their neighbor in anything, out of fear that the neighbor might surreptitiously gain an advantage and compel a vain regret within them. Should they, in a way, set out on a heist together, certainly none of them will reveal their hidden intentions. And once they arrive at their destination, more often than not, a bitter conflict erupts among them. The first to launch towards the loot is an enemy of anyone else launching for it as well, seeking to displace him. A third gleefully uses his opportunity and starts to steal for himself. Though a fourth might join him and do the same, and the two would begin to scuffle as well. And a fifth would quietly steal for himself again. Should a sixth come along, a new battle erupts, and a seventh might have a chance to steal until an eighth shows up. All of them are fighting, and none will allow the repository or the loot therein to be taken from them. And so you see, no devil will assist another in anything though their accumulation on one spot, brought about by their extreme selfishness, does nonetheless increase the weight of the loot. It is as if you place two equal weights on the pans of a scale, which mutually give no advantage. However, if you spread just a measly little drop of honey on one of the weights, immediately the sweet fragrance attracts thousands of bees. They will sit on the weight and tip the scale significantly, without even intending to. Can you accuse God of lacking wisdom simply because he has given the bee a sense of smell and the desire for honey, and the honey itself its aromatic and attractive sweetness? Or is the Lord foolish for having designed his creations to be not only highly practical, but also most beautiful, each in his own way? Is it somehow unwise of him to have given the Virgin its most attractive and alluring form, so that she must have the greatest value in the eyes of the brusque men of this world, prompting them to leave both father and mother and joyfully espouse their tender and dear women? But as can already be seen in the external world, that a being attracts another by one of its characteristics, all the more so is this the case in the world of the spirits. And if it were not so, then how could there exist an earth, a moon, a sun, as well as all other planetary bodies throughout the immeasurable space of creation? One atom has sympathy with its neighbor. Both attract each other. Whatever the both of them do, countless others do the same. They attract everything that is like them and therefrom culminates a world, as the Lord has tangibly described it to his disciples last night. And you will find it written thus within the great book that has been given to all of you. But if this is the way things are, then is it unwise of the Lord to permit every soul to have the most essential and unconditional freedom of will, as well as the naturally resulting consequences? Or would you praise God for his wisdom if someone wished to travel from here to Jerusalem and set out on the journey, but despite being more than willing and familiar with the route he will need to take, he would not travel to Jerusalem where he had important business to do, but instead to Damascus where he had nothing to do at all, because God did not wish for anyone to bear the consequences of their desires and actions. Tell me if you would find such a divine arrangement to be wise. Or do you perhaps find it nonsensical for bees, wasps, hornets, or all sorts of flies to veritably blanket you and eat you alive, should you go out into the open air covered in honey? When your soul emits a sinful fragrance of passion into its external sphere of life, and the souls already released from the flesh, but nonetheless still yearning for that same fragrance, scent it within your sphere of life, and eventually fall upon you, 
fixating themselves on your surplus without even knowing what it is they are doing, simply gathering around you in ever greater numbers, for they find the desired nourishment in your presence. Then that is certainly not foolish of the Creator, for there is nothing he respects quite as much as the unrestricted and unconditional freedom of every single soul. Indeed, every soul possesses the means to rid itself of the uninvited guests, as often and whenever it wishes. Should you wish to not be bothered by stinging insects when out in the open, wash and cleanse yourself of the honey foolishly smeared on your person, for then you will have rest. And should you wish to keep your external sphere of life free of demons seeking to weaken and torment your soul, then go ahead and embrace the well-known order of the Lord. I guarantee you that no demon will ever come close to your sphere of life again. Believe me when I tell you this. No demon will attract, tempt or seduce you unless you attract them first by some wicked inclination, for which you yourself are solely responsible. However, once you have attracted them, you have only yourself to blame when, by their congestion around your person, the passion at the heart of the matter becomes even more ingrained in your soul, without you even wishing it.